Our scripture today is taken from the Old Testament, 2 Samuel, um, chapter 15, beginning at verse 13. A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. The king set out with his entire household following him, but he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him, and they halted at a place some distance away. All his men marched past him, along with all the Catharites and <coughs> Pelatites and all the 600 Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. The king said to Ittai, the Gittite, Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner, an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I'm going. Go back and take your countrymen. May kindness and faithfulness be with you. But Ittai replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, wherever it means life or death, there will your servant be. David said to Ittai, Go ahead, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the desert. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Shall we pray? And now, O Lord, I ask that our minds might be receptive to your holy word, and that our hearts might be receptive and responsive to your Holy Spirit. This we ask through your holy name. Amen. Well, for those of you that have known me for a few years, um, you know that I like humor, and I like to be around people with humor in their lives. Maybe you have heard this little story, but it bears repeating. A ten-year-old boy was failing math. His parents tried everything to get him to succeed, but nothing worked, and finally, they sent him to summer school at the Catholic school. From, the, <coughs> from his first day, the boy spent hours studying. When his report card came home, he received an A in math. His father said, son, what made the difference? All year, you have failed, and this school has really turned you around. Was it that you had a nun teaching you, perhaps? Dad, I never took math seriously before, the boy admitted. But when I walked in the front door of the school and saw this man nailed to a plus sign, I knew the place really meant business. <laughs> Father, forgive me. <laughs> Horatio G. Spafford, you've probably heard about him. And uh, he was a successful Chicago lawyer. Lost most, most of his wealth in the financial crisis of 1873. He sent his wife and four daughters on a trip to France, but on their way their ship was struck by another ship and it sank. And of 225 passengers, 87 of them survived. Mrs. Spafford was among the survivors, but their four daughters perished. As soon as she reached land, she telegraphed to her husband, saved alone, children lost. What shall I do? Spafford left for France to join his wife and returned her to Chicago. And in the depth of this bereavement, he wrote his only hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Perhaps the words of the stanza 
will take on a new meaning for us as we think about them. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Beautiful, beautiful hymn. The message title today is When Your Life's Walls Begin to Tumble. So you're saying, what is this man going to speak about? Note this, beloved, that in the midst of the greatest crisis of his life, Horatio Spafford was able to rise above <coughs> the power of his personal pain and loss. Today, I want us to look at one of the most troubling times in the life of David and examine some of the principles that we see in his life and what he went through and when he went through a major crisis. It's painful and personal. Understand that the most painful crisis that we face are normally of a personal nature. David hears from a messenger that the nation of Israel has turned against him. And the cause is his son, Absalom. Absalom was leading a rebellion to overthrow David and to seize the throne. And David, like us, had made some major errors in his life. One of the things he did was he multiplied wives. And God told him not to multiply wives like the pagans do. Solomon, his son, who reigned after him, uh, took that whole area to a, another dimension, as you know. But David had these wives, and they all gave him children. These children were not full brothers and sisters, but step-siblings. Same father, different mothers. So there were sexual attractions, there were rivalries that went on, and what happens earlier in 2 Samuel is that one of David's sons gets a thing for his stepsister and lures her into his room pretending to be sick. He moves on her and she tries to resist. And he tells her he loves her. And he finally uh, <coughs> rapes her. And the moment of that rape, he starts to detest her as much as he said he loved her. When feelings aren't grounded in something spiritual or real, love can turn to hate very quickly. And so she goes away shamed and lives uh, the rest of her life as a widow. And David is upset when he hears this, but Absalom, he waits cunningly or a long time and then has little, a little get-together at his home and invites uh, that half-brother. And while there, Absalom kills him. This shocks David, but what can you expect? Note, beloved, when you disobey God, <clears throat> those, all those seeds of disobedience, do you think everything will go perfectly right for you? As <clears throat> in life, we face many crises, we face many difficulties. And our reaction to them, if you're grounded in Christ, makes all the difference. Been there and done that. Absalom flees and lives in exile for a while and finally returns and reunited with his father, David. But we learn that this fellow Absalom is a problem. He is cunning like a fox, watching and seeing all that is going on. He wants the throne and is ambitious for it. So he plots and plans and stirs the pot, so to speak. He goes to the city gate and begins talking to the people to stir them up and to sway them towards him. What's your problem? You mean to tell me King David has no one to care for you, no one to provide for you, and there's nothing more that people like is receiving sympathy. So here Absalom is betraying and sabotaging his own father. Absalom even smooth-talks some of David's officers, and the next thing he holds the party and declares himself king with some of David's former leaders. And that is when the messenger shows up. And you can read more in 2 Samuel to get the complete story. After Absalom dies and God takes care of business, David mourns so much he irritates his own loyal troops who say, Look, David, 
this man was trying to kill you. You have to move on. When those walls begin to tumble, we find ourselves in an emotional state. A crisis can come at you through your workplace, through your home, through your spouse, through your children, through your grandchildren. And let me, let me interject here as an aside. Pray for these precious little young people that you have, that God has entrusted to you. Little Noah has come into the world, the youngest of the congregation. Pray for their salvation and a hedge of protection around them. So important. Those of you that teach, you know this only too well. Um, schools are not Christian schools as we would like them to be. And so I sort of feel, and I think the teachers here too, that when we're in the public system, we can be an example and a witness, at least try to be. So I always am happy with my students. I joke with them and have a good time. And I smile at them because we may be the only representative of Jesus that they see. Because so many families over and over and over again are in crisis situations. Even just minding your own business, a crisis, beloved, is no respecter of persons, nor is it fair when it strikes often. A crisis becomes personal when it involves your family. A crisis becomes personal when others assault your reputation and character. A crisis becomes personal, beloved, when others seek to inflict pain on you. A crisis becomes personal when you are smitten or stricken with an illness. And that's prevalent in today's world. So many people, we pray for so many people who are struggling with sickness. And you, as a Christian, can be an encouragement to them. Sometimes you need to regroup before you act and go before the Lord and wait. We're not a patient people, are we? We like things done yesterday. <laughs> Sometimes you need to ask God to illuminate your mind and heart in how to work through a crisis. How to help someone else work through a crisis. David takes immediate action to begin regrouping. At this point, he has only two options, fight or flight. A bit of humor. When I was a younger man in my 20s, I was teaching high school in Sispani and I were teaching high school in um, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, at a large Christian school. And I was teaching psychology to grade 11s, and I came across this, uh, when we are frightened, we will fight, protect ourselves, or we will flee. So I thought, well, we can do a, I can do a, a, a good illustration here. So I asked one of the grade 12 boys, a Mennonite lad in grade 12, and I said, Chuck, you come into the room and pretend you're upset, and with a mark I gave you, and I will say, well, I'll talk to you when you come into my class later, thank you, and I'll try to close the door. You push the door open and you punch me. And so I didn't think he would take it so seriously. <laughs> and he punched me. <laughs> and then I thought, fight or flight, okay, I'll push back. So I pushed him back and he put me in a headlock. This is the teacher. <laughs> we, had the, we had the vice principal all set up for this. So all of a sudden the door opens and Mr. Adams comes in and says, Chuck, you go to the office, and Mr. Bradley, you go to the teacher's room and get a coffee and chill out. So we, the three of us ran upstairs, turned on the intercom into my room to see what the students were going to say. Well, one kid says, oh, Chuck's going to be expelled. He hit a teacher. Another kid says, well, Mr. Bradley hit him back, and they're debating this. So then I came in with my coffee, and I said, they're all wide-eyed, and I said, so did you think that was a real confrontation? It wasn't. <laughs> and so I said, you know, I was trying to get the uh, idea across. I'm sure the kids have never forgotten that. I know I haven't, especially when I got punched. <laughs> oh, my. Two options David had, fight or flight. By fleeing the coming coup attempt, David does three things. He preserves the sanctity of Jerusalem. He provides for his family and he protects his military strength. Note this, beloved. Reduce the risk of injury to other people. 
as David leaves Jerusalem, he speaks with one of the military leaders that's traveling out of the city. Ittai was not Jewish, but rather a foreign mercenary under the service of King David. Ittai and his guards served as a type of honor guard for David and didn't have to leave with him. However, David knew the agreement he had made with Ittai and his men could no longer be met. This was no situation for innocent people. Beloved, learn from David that we need to do our best to keep those who are innocent out of the crisis in order to keep them safe. David tells Ittai to return to Jerusalem for several reasons. One, David wants Ittai out of harm's way. Two, David can't fulfill his end of their agreement. Three, David doesn't know his course of action. And note this, take time to worship. Even in the midst of this dangerous situation, David takes the time to worship God. Zadok brought the Ark of the Covenant out to where David and Abiathar offered sacrifices to God until everyone had left the city. David was literally running for his life. But that didn't mean that he wouldn't seek God. Note, when we take time to worship, it is literally seeking the presence of the Almighty. Do you know that when you come to a crisis point in your life, how important it is to seek the presence and peace of the Lord? This crisis could be compared to walking up through uh, the rough side of a mountain. When we do that and we seek the Lord, we learn the wonderful grace of God is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, beloved, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. What a wonderful promise. Note, beloved, that God's grace keeps pace with whatever we may face. Can you remember that? That's a rhyming, uh, rhyming word, words there. Pace, <coughs> grace, pace, and faith. We also learn that the ways of God are not ours. Have you run into that? For those of us that are believers and Christ followers, the things of God are foolishness unto man. They really are. You know, um, I remember in Brockville years ago, there was a Christian couple. Um, they lived in Brockville, and their neighbors had a pool, and Sunday morning they would... Um, our friend Winston would be swimming in the pool and his wife, uh, Sharon, would be uh, um, getting breakfast and bringing it out to the side of the pool. And, and they said, look at those neighbors of ours. They're constantly going to church. They must be weird or something. Well, it was, a, I don't know how many months later, but uh, the woman that was considered weird invited Sharon to church to a women's event. And the Spirit of God touched her heart. And you know what happened. She became a believer. And she came to faith. And she told her husband about this. And he never came for a while, but then he came. And eventually he came to faith. And now they, our friends, live in Ottawa and they attend Metropolitan Bible Church. But there again, they understand now because they've experienced the grace of God and the saving power of Jesus. What a difference. Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways. Allow God to take the issue, the crisis, the problem that you face and deal with it to bring glory to Him as well as peace to you and yours. Have you ever been in a place that you just think, maybe if I just throw up my hands, nothing is happening here. God isn't listening. Mm -hmm. If you turn it over to God, God will do the miraculous and you have not had to do anything except let him take the reins. And please don't be a micromanager because you just can't micromanage God. You ever met a micromanager? Give you the assignment and then the person comes in and does it. <laughs> I worked for a principal like that one time and I chuckled to myself and thought, okay, <laughs> if you need to micromanage, that's fine. But you can't micromanage God, can you? Beloved, David teaches us a valuable lesson that we sometimes 
seldom learn during our crisis. God can accomplish what we cannot because he has a plan for each of us. And you think, a plan for each of us? What can I do? I don't know, but God does if you let him tell you what to do. In our lives, when a situation moves beyond our ability to deal with it, we must give it over to God and be patient and let him work it out. Been there and done that. And it's a long thing. I'm learning. I'm learning more and more. Leave it with God. Pray much. Speak less. And God will work things out. Prayer is one of your most valued resources during a crisis. Just as worship is a seeking of God's presence and power, and prayer is seeking of God's provision. David, of course, we know as the writer of Psalms. Now it was during this time that David wrote a psalm. Scholars believe this because we see David on the run and we see him still as king. So I want us to know that David is fearful. We're human. How is this going to work out? In his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time for God's people as we Pray and follow the Lord. The enemy of our soul causes us all kinds of crazy thoughts. Because it is in times when our walls begin to tumble and crumble that we either learn to stand or you find out that you do not have it together and you tumble with your walls. David understood something that we often forget when a crisis comes. Worship needs to remain high on our priority list. Have you ever come to church and you've been feeling sort of down and dismal and you've come to church and you've gone home feeling so much better? That's a plug for coming to church. Um, Sometimes I've gone to church and I I appreciated pastor, but I, I got more from somebody that spoke to me and said, a word, spoke a word into my life. Or the music lifted my spirits. Church is, gathering together is vitally important because if you stay alone and say, yeah, I'm just going to sit on my deck and have coffee and not bother with church, and pretty soon that's opening a door for the enemy to come in and say, you know those people, they, we, I don't want to be with them. Look at those people, they're not, they're not real Christians, they're hypocrites. The enemy puts those thoughts in our minds and pretty soon It's very easy to get out of tune. And uh, it's very important that we surround ourselves with Christian people and friends. Am I saying you don't don't relate to uh, people that don't attend church or know God? No. How else would you be a missionary if, if, if we just all stayed in a little cocoon, us four and no more? But make sure that your close friends know Jesus as you do. Psalm 63, 6, On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. When the walls tumble, beloved, it is important that you think properly. You cannot stop thinking, but what are you thinking about? And even when you are tired, you still are thinking, but you must train yourself to think properly. David only thought of the situation with Absalom, so David decides that on his bed he would think about God. Almost all feeling and emotion is a product of thought. What people think make them happy or sad. People go into a movie or an opera and uh, come out crying because they've been two hours watching a movie or two hours in an opera and the emotion is part of us. When we get into trouble and the walls start to tumble in on us, we think about it and analyze it which makes things worse. You can't change it. The situation with Absalom is the situation. It is what it is, as they say. This is the difference between faith and fantasy. You don't recreate reality by denying something is happening. Have you ever met people who uh, go around rebuking everything, trying to convince themselves it isn't real? 
So you cut your hand and you shout out loud, I rebuke that. Well, when you are cut and bleeding, beloved, you're cut and bleeding. It is what it is. Can God heal you? Yes. Uh, the Bible says, if anyone is sick among you, let him call. You have to admit you are sick before you call the elders of the church. The people that are sour all the time, they think sour thoughts. Have you ever met to sour people? Um, when I was visiting one of the seniors' homes in the area, um, I went in and the lady uh, was on her bed and the poor soul, I said, uh, I was wearing my clerical collar and as soon as I got close to her bed, she looked at me and she said, get out! <laughs> she was German. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll give it one more time. So a couple weeks later, I came in and I didn't get in the door. I got to the door and she said, get out! <laughs> And the nurses at the nurses' station said, Pastor, that must have been the shortest pastoral visit you ever made. And it was not her. It was her condition. Psalm 63, 7, I sing in the shadow of your wings. The Bible says God inhabits what? The praises of his people. So we should praise. My wife, when, when we were, our girls were little, um, as soon as there was something in in our devotional time uh, usually at supper my wife would break out into song and the girl said mom would you stop with the songs but she's a musical person so she sings and when I come home Bonnie is often singing hymns at the piano downstairs by herself God inhabits the praises of his people start your day with praise to God I guarantee things will go better and when you get to work and that boss is ugly with you you know you just say Whatsoever state I find myself, I will rejoice. Psalm 63, 8, my soul clings to you. You say, God, your right hand is extended to hold me. I will cling to you. I won't walk alone, but I will trust you and cling to you and your promises. You can take it to the market on the promises of God that they're true. So when your walls begin to tumble, beloved, you're going to remember just three words that come in David's psalm. Think, sing, and cling. Make sure your thinking is good and not corrupted. Sing praises unto the Lord and cling to Him. And your life will be better. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you this morning for this attentive Congregation, you have assembled and summoned us to come to worship you. We praise you, we glorify you, we adore you. And so, Father, take our offerings of praise to you and bless, O oh God, this, these people this week and their families. Again, keep a hedge of protection around them. And may we be seen as lights in this community and beyond, which this church does so well. Missionary efforts bless them and bless my colleague, Pastor Dan and Gwyneth, as they are mourning the loss of an uncle. Be with Pastor Dan's parents, Mike and Johanna. And Father, we just pray that uh, we will continue to grow in the grace of God. This we ask in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.